Thank you for coming. Uh, each year, the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions uh, brings uh, a scholar to campus to deliver a series of three lectures. Uh, this uh, we, we have named the Charles E. Test MD Distinguished Visiting uh, Scholars Program. And it's intended to exemplify uh, uh, the highest possible standards of excellence in the humanities and social sciences. The series is made possible by the generosity of Charles E. Test, uh, who is uh, an MD. The program is honored to present to the university community our 2006 Charles E. Test, MD, Distinguished Visiting Scholar, Dr. Leon Cass. Uh, Dr. Cass will be with us today and the next two afternoons uh, addressing Keeping Life Human, Biology and Human Dignity. Today, he will be speaking on uh, the topic, A More Perfect Human, The Promise and Peril of Modern Science. Tomorrow afternoon, he will speak on the dignity of human being, death with dignity, and the sanctity of life. And then on Wednesday, he will conclude with a lecture on the dignity of human flourishing, biotechnology, and the pursuit of happiness. All of these lectures will be in this room at 4.30. Leon Cass is the Addie Clark Harding Professor in the Committee on Social Thought and the College at the University of Chicago and her TOG Fellow in Social Thought at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Professor Cass earned his BS and his MD degrees at the University of Chicago and his PhD in biochemistry from Harvard University. Uh, after uh, his education, uh, his formal education, he did research in molecular biology at the National Institutes of Health while serving in the United States Public Health Service. Dr. Cass has been engaged for over 35 years with ethical and philosophical issues raised by biomedical advance and more recently with broader moral and cultural issues. From 1970 to 1972, uh, Professor Cass served as Executive Secretary of the Committee on the Life Sciences and Social Policy of the National Research Council, the National Academy of Sciences, whose report titled Assessing Biomedical Technologies provided one of the first overviews of the emerging moral and social questions posed by biomedical advance. He uh, has taught at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, the great, great books uh, college, and served as Joseph P. Kennedy Senior Research Professor in Bioethics at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University uh, before uh, returning in 1976 to the University of Chicago. At Chicago, uh, he, uh, as a teacher, has been deeply involved in undergraduate education and committed to the study of classic texts. His books include Toward a More Natural Science, Biology and Human Affairs, The Hungry Soul, Eating and the Perfecting of Our Nature, The Ethics of Human Cloning, which he wrote with James Q. Wilson, uh, A Reader uh, that he edited with his wife, uh, Dr. Amy Cass, Wing to Wing, or to Or, Readings on Courting and Marrying. Uh, having, have, having two daughters in college, I keep recommending this book to them. <laughs> Hope that they will read it. Life, Liberty, and the Defense of Dignity, The Challenge for Bioethics, and his most recent book, The Beginning of Wisdom, Reading Genesis. From 2001 to 2005, Dr. Cass served two terms as chairman of the President's Council 
on bioethics, uh, uh, on which council, of course, Professor uh, Robert George, director of the Madison program, also serves. Uh, under Dr. Cass's leadership, the council published six major books and a white paper on topics ranging from human cloning and human dignity to ethical caregiving in our aging society. In 2003, he was one of the four inaugural recipients of the Bradley Prize for Intellectual and Civic Achievement. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Amy Cass, his collaborator, uh, uh, for being with us today. Welcome, Amy. And uh, with that, I will turn over the podium to Dr. Cass. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out uh, to uh, join me in this afternoon's conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted and, and feel very honored to be invited to give these lectures at, at Princeton and especially under the uh, auspices of the James Madison program, a program for which I have the highest regard. I hope people in this community realize what an enormous treasure this is in the American uh, academic scene. And uh, I, uh, I really can't say um, how much I, I appreciate the work that's being done by Robbie George and his colleagues here. So um, it, it is a special treat uh, to come here uh, with that sponsorship. The first lecture, uh, as you've been told, is entitled, A More Perfect Human, The Promise and Peril of Modern Science. As nearly everyone appreciates, we live near the beginning of the golden age of biomedical science and technology. For the most part, we should be mightily glad that we do. We and our friends and loved ones are many times over the beneficiaries of its cures for diseases, prolongation of life, and amelioration of suffering, psychic and somatic. Since the latter third of the last century, most human beings living in technologically advanced countries have been living healthier and longer lives than even, most fortunate, even the most fortunate individuals in prior human history. Diphtheria, typhoid, and tuberculosis threaten us no longer. Despite the lack of a definitive cure, half the people who are today treated for deadly cancers survive more than five years. The average American's life expectancy at birth has increased from 47 to in 1900 to over 78 in 2000, and millions are now living healthily into their 80s and 90s. Thanks to basic research in neuroscience and new psychotropic drugs, the scourge of major depression and other devastating mental illnesses are finally under effective attack. We have every reason to look forward eagerly to new discoveries and new medical blessings. Every one of us should be deeply grateful for the gifts of human ingenuity and for the devoted efforts of scientists, physicians, and entrepreneurs who have used these gifts to make those benefits possible. Yet notwithstanding these blessings present and projected, we have also seen more than enough to make us concerned. For we recognize that the powers made possible by biomedical science can be used for non-therapeutic purposes, serving ends ranging from the frivolous and disquieting to the offensive and pernicious. These powers are available as instruments of bioterrorism, for example, genetically engineered drug-resistant bacteria or drugs to obliterate memory as agents of social control, for example, drugs to tame rowdies and dissenters or fertility blockers for welfare recipients, and as means of trying to improve or perfect our bodies and minds and those of our children, for example, genetically engineered super muscles or drugs to improve memory. Anticipating possible threats to our security, freedom, and even our very humanity, many people are increasingly worried about where biotechnology may be taking us. We are concerned not only about what others might do to us, but also what we might do to ourselves. We are concerned that our society might be harmed and that we might ourselves be diminished, indeed in ways that could undermine the highest and richest possibilities of human life. Most of us cheerfully believe that we can both enjoy the promise and escape the perils of the coming biotechnological age. 
Most of us also believe that there is little connection between the promise and the peril, or between the humanistic aspirations that fuel the scientific enterprise and the deadly or dehumanizing uses to which new technologies might perversely be put. But a powerful challenge to our complacent opinion is provided by an important exhibit prepared by the United States Holocaust Museum entitled Deadly Medicine, Creating the Master Race. This exhibit was in Washington for several years and is now traveling around the country to, Prince, to Pittsburgh, to Atlanta, and to Minneapolis. If you get a chance, you really should see it. This exhibit documents the abominable uses that the Nazis made of science and medicine. But even more relevant for us, it also presents the scientific outlook on life and, on, and the aspiration to human perfectibility that the Nazis inherited and exploited, an outlook and an aspiration that dwell robustly in American cultural life today. Part one of this talk is then called Science as Salvation, a Cautionary Tale. The Deadly Medicine exhibit actually invites us to self-attention because of where it starts and how it's structured. The first of the exhibit's three parts, devoted to pre-Nazi Weimar eugenic ideas and practices, is entitled Science as Salvation. The next two parts display first the biological state through which those eugenic ideas were turned into Nazi racial hygiene, 1933 to 1939, and last, the final solution through which Nazi racial hygienic practices became, 1939 to 45, mass murderous. The exhibit thus locates the Nazi medical atrocities in the company of an idealistic science that preceded it, and it asks us to ponder whether there is any deep connection between the beauty of the glass man, which I will show you in a moment, and the night of the broken glass and of the horrors thereafter. The true power of this exhibit lies in the question that it tacitly poses regarding the relation between the last phase and the first. What, if any, is the connection, not only historical, but also logical, between the final solution and the disposition to look to science for salvation? How, if at all, are the optimistic dreams of building a more perfect human through science and medicine related to the actual building of death camps in which real human beings, deemed worthless and worse, were exterminated like so much vermin. Now, nothing in the exhibit suggests that the idealistic science of Weimar produced or even necessarily led to the final solution, though we do learn there that the former sowed the seeds that were later used to grow the murderous fruit. And it is surely not the exhibit's even subliminal intention to suggest that noble science need elsewhere become, however unintentionally, the handmaid of bestiality, or further that genetics or medicine or psychiatry now as well as then should come under suspicion of lending strength to deadly inhumanity. Yet, and on the other hand, the exhibit to its great credit does not allow us lovers of science and progress to rest comfortably with the belief that the Nazis simply corrupted and perverted science or that their science wasn't really science, or that their nefarious purposes were worlds apart from the humanitarian aspirations of modern medicine. The exhibit compels us to consider whether the Nazi use of medical science might have been less a perversion of science, more a monstrously evil yet also logically fitting conclusion from certain dubious premises and attitudes in the scientific outlook itself and especially from the prevailing assumptions about the role of science in human affairs. Is there perhaps something wrong, even deadly wrong, in seeing science as our salvation? If so, then we might need to be on our guard when this siren song is sung to us, as it is today increasingly be, being sung by an ever larger, louder, and much more competent chorus. To reach the ghastly result, the eugenic and perfectionist vision of Weimar had to be politicized by the Nazis and in a most particular way. The project for the final solution depended decisively on the presence of a nearly omnicompetent totalitarian and tyrannical state, enforcing state-sponsored racial and ethnic hatreds, and assaulting the traditional teaching, both biblical and liberal democratic, of the irreducible and equal dignity of every human individual. God willing, we shall not see such a regime again. 
compassionate people like ourselves who enjoy the protections of liberal democratic institutions, strong cultural prejudice favoring the individual against the collective, and, however much diminished, the invaluable Judeo-Christian belief in the sanctity of human life can reasonably believe that it cannot happen here. And I surely agree with this conclusion. But, and this is the first important point I wish to make, the explicitly Nazi elements of tyranny and race hatred are not absolutely necessary for producing a deadly medicine, even if it never again becomes a holocaust. A free people choosing for ourselves can and very likely will produce similar deadly fruit from the same dangerous seeds, unless we are ever vigilant against the dangers. This lecture seeks to identify some of the deadly dangers that lurk in the seductive ide and ideas and practice of science as salvation. The essence of the peril lies, ironically, in the zealous pursuit of the more perfect human. Now, first, before actually uh, making the argument, let me give a word of caution against the possible misunderstanding. Although I shall be raising questions about the idea and practice of scientism, nothing that I shall sh say should be taken as anti-science or anti-scientists. The question before us is not the goodness of science and medicine as such, but the goodness of looking to science and medicine as the solution for the human condition, for the relief and salvation of man's estate. Now, the first two images from the Holocaust Museum's exhibit pose the problem and set the stage for all my reflections, the glass man and the photographs of the survivors from the First World War. Uh, the screen is suddenly going off. Ah, there it is. The exhibit opens with a stunning glass man, first displayed at the German Hygiene Museum in Dresden in 1930. Though many of us become familiar with transparent models of the human body, they are today marketed widely as science toys for school children, it is difficult to exaggerate the excitement that those original models created. For the first time, the common man could glimpse a lifelike model of his insides, organ by organ, artery by artery, nerve by nerve seeing with illuminated brilliance all the parts that make him run. Far from looking ashamed or diminished by this anatomizing invasion of his inner being, the glass man stands toweringly toward us, fitly and proudly with arms uplifted in a gesture of triumphant appeal for heavenly applause, a model of human perfection, not to say apotheosis. Moreover, this perfect man clearly came not from the hand of God, but from an even more perfect human being, the scientific and medical visionary who would someday soon help humankind collectively achieve the help, healthful perfection here modeled in glass. Make no mistake, this is serious business. For the glass man was willy-nilly the emblem of a new religion. In place of the God who became man, we have here the man become as God. In place of the suffering Christ, arms stretched in crucifixion, we have the impervious glass man, arms elevated in self-exaltation. And creatively behind the scene, in place of a God who, is said, who it is said sent his son who would through his own suffering take away the sins of the world, we have the scientific savior who would take away the sin of suffering altogether. The glass man in loco crucifixus is the perfect icon for salvific science. The dream of perfect health and fitness was, of course, quite ancient. Indeed, 300 years earlier, it acquired an honored place among the goals of modern science when its great founders, Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, summoned humankind to the conquest of nature for the relief of man's estate. Mastery and possession of nature, Descartes announces, quote, is desirable not only for the invention of an infinity of artifices would enable, which would enable us to enjoy without any pain the fruits of the earth and all the commodities to be found there, but also and principally for the conservation of health, which is without doubt the primary good 
and the foundation of all other goods in this life. As the sequel makes clear, Descartes had his eye on grander goals than the mere absence of disease or even just ordinary bodily health. And I quote again, for even the mind is so dependent on the temperament and the disposition of the organs of the body that if it is possible to find some means that generally renders men more wise and more capable than they have been up until now, I believe that we must seek for it in medicine. We could be spared an infinity of diseases of the body as well as of the mind, and even also of the enfeeblement of old age, if we had enough knowledge of their causes and all the remedies which nature has provided us." End of quote. But this ancient dream of perfect health and fitness had acquired a new prominence in Europe owing to the Great War only recently ended. Images from the aftermath of that war, the second display of the exhibit, provide the counterpart to the glass man and in part explain his great social appeal. Human deformity from loss of limbs to loss of mind came home from the war to Germany and to all of Europe by the tens and hundreds of thousands. The maimed and the enfeebled had rarely, if ever, been seen in such numbers. Thanks, please note, to the great technological improvements for waging war. And the response of the German mind humiliated in the war did not take the most compassionate turn. On the contrary, fear and loathing of the deformed and the defective found their expression as hatred of imperfection grew up with and encouraged the desire to imitate the perfection of the glass man. Let me turn off the lights here. In 1920, right after the war ended and well before the Nazi period, a distinguished jurist, Karl Bindink, and a distinguished physician, Alfred, Dr. Alfred Hoch, published a chilling booklet entitled On Permitting the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Life, Lebens und Werten's Lebens. Beginning modestly with the defense of the moral acceptability of suicide and assisted suicide, Bindung and Hoch moved cunningly to a defense of killing those whose miserable condition of body or mind calls for the healing remedy of premature death from the hand of medical science. Contemplating the battlefield strewn with thousands of dead youths and comparing them with the mental hospitals dedicated to the long-term care of the demented and the mentally ill, Bindung comments, I quote, one will be deeply shaken by the strident clash between the sacrifice of the finest flower of humanity in its full measure on the one side and by the meticulous care shown to existences which are not just absolutely worthless, but even of negative value on the other." Unquote. And Dr. Hoch ends his medical part of the booklet with a peon to the dawning of a new age. I quote, there was a time now considered barbaric in which eliminating those who were born unfit for life or who later became so was taken for granted. Then came the phase continuing into the present in which preserving every existence, no matter how worthless, stood as the highest moral value. But a new age will arrive, operating with a higher morality and with great sacrifice, which will actually give up the requirements of an exaggerated humanism and overvaluation of mere existence." Unquote. A vigorous society comprising only healthy and fit members is more than justified in doing battle with the evils of deformity and disability by cleansing society of the disabled and the deformed themselves. These twin goals, the positive goal of seeking perfection, the negative goal of removing imperfection, are to repeat nothing new. They are of ancient pedigree. Indeed, let's be fair they inspire much of the good that we do in life and not only in medicine. We pursue virtue or excellence. We stifle vice and correct mediocrity. We urge our children to be good and our societies to be better. We try to eliminate the deficiencies and evils to which they are sus subject. For Christians, the counsel of perfection is even a divine injunction. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Though the perfection Jesus had in mind, I am confident, cannot be pictured in glass. To be sure, there is always a danger that we will turn our, our opposition to deficiency 
into a rejection of those who bear it. That, for example, the battle against ignorance or impairment will translate into a hatred for the ignorant or the impaired. Indeed, by calling them after their imperfections, he is a paraplegic, she is a downs, we show our penchant for not distinguishing between the sin and the sinner. But this age-old tendency acquires a new character and a new momentum in an age that not only extols and exhorts to perfection, but also, and more importantly, gathers the scientific means to pursue it. So just as the loathing of imperfection fuels the search for perfection, so the search for perfection makes imperfection all the more intolerable. Such is the inner meaning of science seen as salvation, informed now by a new idea of human perfection that has in the end little patience with human frailty and disability. That attitude is once again gaining strength, and this time it comes with first-rate science and powerful and precise technique. And unlike in pre-World War II Germany, it speaks in the seductive voices of freedom, compassion, and self-improvement. The technologies of interest touch all aspects of human life from beginning through middle to end. Even as we stand but at the dawn of the new age ushered in by deciphering the entire human genome, we are already widely practicing genetic screening and prenatal and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis capable of identifying and rooting out the genetically unfit before they can be born. And advances in genetics, developmental biology, and neuroscience promise us all sorts of enhancements in human nature that would make us better than well, both in body and in mind. On the negative side, eliminating imperfections, the prime targets for prevention, correction, and elimination are mental retardation and mental illness, severe bodily deformity and disability, and later in life, dementia, debility, and enfeeblement, serious imperfections all. On the positive side, promoting perfection, the prime targets for improvement are memory, muscularity, mood, temperament, intelligence, and the holy grail, human finitude itself, to be ameliorated through the conquest of biological senescence. Time does not permit me today a proper examination of even one of these promises. They will figure more prominently in the next two lectures. The negative goals as exemplified in proposals for euthanasia and assisted suicide at the end of life will be the subject of tomorrow's lecture. The positive goals as exemplified by the use of biomedical enhancements to promote human flourishing will be the subject of the third lecture. Today, taking a more synoptic overview, but with some special attention to eugenics, I will briefly review some of the more obvious sources of the danger moral hazards that are especially difficult for us to recognize because our practices appear to be governed not by the coercive state policies, but by unconstrained, free human choice. There are two sorts of moral hazards, dangerous practices and dangerous thoughts. I begin with the first, and the title of the next part is Dangerous Practices, Negative and Positive Eugenics. In the exciting early days of the genetic revolution in the 1960s and 1970s, both positive and negative eugenic goals were enunciated with great gusto. Conferences were held with the bold titles of Genetics and the Future of Man. At one such meeting, the distinguished molecular biologist Robert Sinsheimer enthused that, quote, for the first time in all time, a living creature understand its origins, understands its origins and can undertake to design its future we can be the agent of transition to a wholly new path of evolution." Unquote. About the same time, the Nobel laureate Joshua Lederberg, when the first frogs were cloned, saw in the prospect of human cloning an end to the rule of chance in human reproduction and the opportunity to perpetuate unaltered the genes of genius. And many people looked forward to discovering whether a second Mozart might outdo the first. About the same time, the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the gentle geneticist Bentley Glass, enunciated a new right, quote, the right of every child to be born with a sound physical and mental constitution based on a sound genotype, unquote. Looking ahead to the reproductive and genetic te technologies that are today rapidly arriving, Glass proclaimed, quote, 
No parents will, in that future time, have a right to burden society with a malformed or a mentally incompetent child." Unquote. Nowadays, we hear almost no such bold eugenic talks from mainstream scientists, though it is brewed about the margins by a small group of bioprophets summoning us to a post-human age or to a remaking of Eden. But eugenic vision and practice are gaining strength, all the more so because they grow out of sight behind the fig leaf of the doctrine of free choice. We are largely unaware that we have as a society already embraced the eugenic principle, defectives shall not be born, because our practices are decentralized and because they operate not by coercion, but by private reproductive choice. Genetic knowledge, we are told, is merely providing information and technique to enable people to make better decisions about their health or their reproductive choices. But our existing practices of genetic screening and prenatal diagnosis show that this claim is at best self-deceptive, at worst disingenuous. The choice to develop and practice genetic screening and the choices of which genes to target for testing have been made not by the public but by scientists and not on liberty enhancing, but on eugenic grounds. Many practice, practitioners of prenatal diagnosis refuse to do fetal genetic screening in the absence of a prior commitment from the woman to abort any afflicted fetus. And many pregnant women who wish not to know prenatal facts must withstand strong medical pressures for testing. Practitioners of prenatal diagnosis working today with but a fraction of the information soon to be available from the Human Genome Project already screen for a long list of genetic diseases and abnormalities from Down syndrome to dwarfism. Possession of any one of these defects, they believe, renders a prospective child unworthy of life. Persons who happen still to be born with these conditions, having somehow escaped the spreading net of detection and eugenic abortion, are increasingly regarded as mistakes, as inferior human beings who should not have been born. Not long ago, at my own university, a physician making rounds with medical students stood over the bed of an intelligent, otherwise normal 10-year-old boy with spina bifida, said, were he to have been conceived today, he would have been aborted. A woman I know with a child who has Down syndrome is asked by total strangers, didn't you have an amnio? The eugenic mentality is taking root, and we are subtly learning with the help of science to believe that there really are certain lives unworthy of being born. Not surprisingly, in the face of these practical possibilities, prominent intellectuals are now providing justification for this view of life. The current journals of bioethics, no less, are filled with writings that sweetly sing the song of Bindung and Hoch, albeit without the menacing German accent. But not all are so reticent. Here, for example, are remarks from the writings of the DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at the University Center for Human Values at Princeton on the question of killing infants with serious yet manageable diseases such as hemophilia. I quote, when the death of a disabled instance, inst infant will lead to the birth of another infant with better prospects for a happy life, the total amount of happiness will be greater if the disabled infant is killed. The loss of a happy life for the first infant is outweighed by the gain of a happier life for the second. Therefore, if killing the hemophiliac infant has no adverse effect on others, according to the total view, it would be right to kill him. In a recent magazine interview, the Princeton professor was asked, quote, what about parents conceiving and giving birth to a child specifically to kill him, take his organs, and transplant them into their ill older children? He replied, I quote again, it is difficult to warm to parents who can take such a detached view, but they're not doing something really wrong in itself. The interviewer then asked, is there anything wrong with a society in which children are bred for spare parts on a massive scale? The Princeton professor of bioethics replied, no. Do not underestimate what it means for us that such coolly lethal opinions regarded since 1945 as barbaric, are today again treated with seriousness, and that promoters of such opinions can occupy professorial chairs of ethics at places like Princeton. Similar ideas and practices are coming into vogue at the other end of life. 
The practice of physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia has been legal in Holland for several decades, and more recently in our own state of Oregon. After several quiet years, the campaign is heating up again, and several state legislatures are once again considering, considering Oregon-type legislation. For a variety of reasons, the age of legalized euthanasia is likely to be soon upon us. <clears throat> Few are going to speak openly, uh, like, like the local professor, about ending worthless lives. But like him, they will promote the deadly practice under the banner of autonomy and choice, graced with slogans of a dignified death, and of course, utilitarian appeals to cut the costs of care. To be sure, large familial and social difficulties of a mass geriatric society are already upon us, destined to become much more severe as the baby boomers enter upon their seniority and, alas, senility. Though vast numbers of old people are today healthier and longer lived than ever before, the price many of them are paying for the extra decade of vigorous old age between 70 and 80 is often another decade between 80 and 90 of enfeeblement, debility, and dementia. Today, over 4.5 million Americans are afflicted with Alzheimer's disease, a number that is predict predicted to triple by mid-century. Thanks to our ability to treat acute illnesses and crises, roughly 40% of us can expect, can expect to spend roughly 10 years of, sorry, 10, let me start again. Thanks to our ability to treat acute illnesses and crises, roughly 40% of us can expect to spend roughly 10 frail, enfeebled, and often demented years at the end of our lives, incapable of caring for ourselves in a world of fewer and fewer familial caregivers, and in most cases, without the resources to purchase decent home or institutional care. Already we hear the dire statistics about the amount of health care costs spent futilely on the last six months of life. Already we hear the call for rationing for not wasting resources on persons with, quote, low quality of life, a gentle Americanism for the German life unworthy of life. I do not want to minimize the ethical anguish that often confronts patients and families when loved ones linger on, their memories gone, their lives little resembling anything like the one they enjoyed in their prime. But I still shudder when I hear the call for a technical quick solution for the need for long -term care, to the need for long-term care, for I know what we have to fear when a shallow notion of death with dignity enlists deadly medical force to solve society's demographic and economic problems. In Holland, we have seen a foretaste of the future. There, the right to die has flowed down the slippery slope to its most radical meaning, and then some. From first a right to refuse treatment, to a right to control one's own dying, to a right to assistance in becoming dead, to a right to voluntary euthanasia, to a right to be mercifully dispatched by one's doctor should he decide that you are better off dead. The descent into unauthorized euthanasia is confirmed by official reports from Holland government reports, with roughly a third of Dutch doctors speaking under immunity, confessing that they have been practicing non-voluntary euthanasia without patient knowledge or consent, including on a significant number of patients who were mentally totally competent. In 2005, without anyone making a fuss, the Dutch issued a protocol for euthanizing severely ill newborns. If this can happen among the liberal and the tolerant Dutch, are we so sure that it cannot happen here? But the battle against imperfection by eliminating the imperfect is only part of our current eugenic story. Much more vigorous is our scientific and biotechnical quest for human improvement, for doing nature one better and making a more perfect human being. Embryos that are now screened for the presence of disease-causing genetic abnormalities may also soon be screened for the presence of certain desirable genetic traits, from perfect pitch to greater height to calmer temperaments, and perhaps someday to higher IQ. And although precise genetic engineering of designer babies seems to me to be pure science fiction, human cloning does hold out the prospect of trying to perpetuate tested superior genotypes. Genetic engineering of adults holds out the promise of enhancing muscle bulk and performance. 
And beyond genetic enhancement, psychoactive drugs are being developed to increase concentration, to erase troubling memories, or to alter, alter personality. And there is active research to increase the maximum life expectancy, from hormone treatments to stem cell-based transplantable tissue, tissues to the ultimate weapon, the control of the genes that determine the rates of aging and the age of death. There is also active research on human-computer interactions, beginning with attempts to enable the deaf to hear and the blind to see, but issuing perhaps in computer implants in the brain that would enable us to download entire libraries at the click of a mouse. Apart from a few zealots such as the immortalists or the bionics boosters around Wired magazine, most people exploring these prospects are not trying to build a superman or a post-human being. They are, by their own lights, just trying to enhance human performance by these more effective biotechnical means, offering a psychophysical route to human improvement that could supplement and extend the improvements we cultivate for ourselves through education or personal training. Yet, especially with large commercial interests hyping the benefits and creating new demand, there is no question but that such enhancements will be widely desired and used to satisfy the age-old personal human dreams of better children, superior performance, ageless bodies, and happy souls. They may even be enlisted to advance certain social goals, enabling soldiers and pilots to go without sleep, or school teachers and prison wardens to pacify the unruly. We have only begun to consider the momentous ethical and social questions in store for us as we head down this road. A report from the President's Council on Bioethics, Beyond Therapy, Biotechnology, and the Pursuit of Happiness is an early effort to articulate our unease at these prospects, and I will present at greater length some of my own arguments on this topic in the third uh, lecture, which will be devoted entirely to, to this topic. And by the way, um, I'm very proud of that particular report of the Council. You can get it uh, at the Council's website, uh, www.bioethics.gov. It's all there. Uh, Beyond Therapy is the title. But to offer an advance word or two tonight, um, I think we are absolutely right to be concerned about the meaning of pursuing venerable human goals by these magical technical means, just as, as we are right to be concerned about the wisdom of trying to transcend through technology the parameters of our given nature, the delicately balanced products of eons of gradual evolution. Will human life really be better if we turn to biotechnology to fulfill our deepest human desires? Will those desires be properly satisfied? Will our enhanced activities really be better and better humanly? There is an old expression, to a man armed with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. To a society armed with biotechnology, the activities of human life may come to be seen in purely technical terms and more amenable to improvement than they really are. Worse, like Midas, we may get more easily what we asked for, only to realize it is vastly less than what we really wanted. We want better children, but not by turning procreation into manufacture or by altering their brains to gain them an edge over their peers. We want to perform better in the activities of life, but not by becoming mere creatures of our chemists or by turning ourselves into bionic tools designed to win and achieve in inhuman ways. We want longer lives, but not at the cost of living carelessly or shallowly with diminished aspirations for living well, or by becoming people so obsessed with our own longevity that we care little about the next generation. We want to be happy, but not by means of drugs that give us happy feelings without the real loves, attachments, and achievements that are essential for true human flourishing. The pursuit of these perfections, defined scientifically and obtained technologically, not only threatens to make us more intolerant of imperfection, both our own and our neighbors, it also threatens to sell short the true, spot, trust, the true prospects for human flourishing, which have always been found in love and friendship, work and play, art and science, song and dance, service and worship, not in chemically induced highs or bionic achievements. Our deepest longings are not for artificial contentment and factitious achievements, but for lives that are meaningful, connected, and humanly flourishing. 
In the absence of knowing what human flourishing really is, there can be no perfecting of human beings or enhancement of human life. And no one can presume to judge any change in human nature or human activity to be an improvement, never mind a perfection, if they do not know what is humanly good. The question we must therefore put to the human enhancers and the post-human futurists is this. What knowledge of the human good do you have that entitles you to gamble the human future on your hunches that these proposed alterations will in fact make us better or happier? It is a question that science and technology simply cannot answer, and worse, that our bioprophets do not even think to ask. No danger we face in the coming age of biotechnology is greater than the danger of careless and shallow thinking. Part three, dangerous thinking, soulless scientism. If we are to avoid both the deadly and the dehumanizing results from our uses of biotechnology, we will need to be vigilant in our practices and resourceful in our thinking. Everything will depend on whether the technological disposition is allowed to proceed to its self-augmenting limits, or whether it can be restricted and brought under intellectual, spiritual, moral, and political rule. But on this front, I regret to say the news is not encouraging. For the relevant intellectual, spiritual, and moral resources of our society, the legacy of civilizing traditions painfully acquired and long preserved are taking a beating not least because they are being called into question by the findings of modern science itself. The technologies present troublesome ethical dilemmas, but the underlying scientific notions, so we are told, call into question the very foundations of our ethics and our human self-understanding. In the 19th and early 20th century, the challenge came in the form of Darwinism and its seeming opposition to biblical religion a battle initiated not so much by the scientists as by the beleaguered defenders of orthodoxy. In our own time, the challenge comes from molecular biology, molecular biology, behavioral genetics, neuroscience, and evolutionary psychology, fueled by the practitioners' overconfident belief in the sufficiency of their reductionist explanations of all vital and human phenomena. Never mind created in the image of God, what elevated humanistic view of human life or human goodness is defensible against the belief trumpeted by biology's most public and prophetic voices that man is just a collection of molecules, an accident on the stage of evolution, a freakish speck of mind in a mindless universe fundamentally no different from other living or even non-living things? What chance have our treasured ideas of freedom and dignity against the reductive notion of the selfish gene or for that matter, of genes for altruism, the belief that DNA is the essence of life, or the teaching that all human behavior and our rich inner life are rendered intelligible only in terms of neurochemistry or their contributions to species survival and reproductive success. These transformations of moral outlook are in fact welcomed by many of our leading scientists and intellectuals. In 1997, the luminaries of the International Academy of Humanism, including biologists Francis Crick, Richard Dawkins, and E.O. Wilson, and humanists Isaiah Berlin, W.V. Quine, and Kurt Vonnegut, issued a statement in defense of cloning research in higher mammals and human beings. Their reasons were revealing. I quote, what moral issues would human cloning raise? Some world religions teach that human beings are fundamentally different from other mammals, that humans have been imbued by a deity with immortal souls, giving them a value that cannot be compared to that of lover, other living things. Human nature is held to be unique and sacred. But as far as the scientific enterprise can determine, humanity's rich repertoire of thoughts, feelings, aspirations, and hopes seem to arise from electrochemical brain processes not from an immaterial soul that operates in, no, in ways no instrument can discover. Views of human nature rooted in humanity's tribal past ought not to be our primary criterion for making moral decisions about cloning. It would be a tragedy if ancient theological scruples could lead to a Luddite rejection of cloning." Unquote. In order to justify ongoing research, 
these intellectuals were willing to shed not only traditional religious views, but any view of human distinctiveness and special dignity, their own included. <clears throat> they fail to see that the scientific view of man they celebrate does more than insult our vanity. It undermines our self-conception as free, thoughtful, and responsible beings, worthy of respect because we alone among the animals have minds and hearts that aim far higher than the mere perpetuation of our genes. It undermines as well the beliefs that sustain our mores, practices, and institutions, including the practice of science itself. <clears throat> the problem, in fact, lies less with the scientific findings themselves, but more with the shallow scientistic philosophy, it is more properly called a faith, that recognizes no other truths but these, and with the arrogant pronouncements of the bioprophets. Here, for example, is the eminent psychologist Steven Pinker railing against any appeal to the human soul. I quote, <clears throat> Unfortunately for that theory, brain science has shown that the mind is what the brain does. The supposedly immaterial soul can be bisected with a knife, altered by chemicals, turned on or off by electricity, and extinguished by a sharp blow or a lack of oxygen. Centuries ago, it was unwise to ground morality on the dogma that the Earth sat at the center of the universe. It is just as unwise today to ground it on dogmas about souls endowed by God." Unquote. One hardly knows whether to be more impressed with the height of Pinker's arrogance or with the depth of his shallowness. But he speaks with the authority of science, and few are able and willing to dispute him on his own grounds. <clears throat> Now, there is, of course, nothing novel about reductionism and materialism of the kind displayed here. These are doctrines with which Socrates contended long ago. What is new is that, as philosophies, they seem to many more people to be vindicated by scientific advance. Here, in consequence, is perhaps the most pernicious result of our technological progress, more dehumanizing than any actual manipulation or technique, present or future. The erosion perhaps the final erosion of the idea of man as noble, dignified, precious, or godlike, and its replacement with a view of man no less than of nature as mere raw material for manipulation and homogenization. Hence our peculiar moral crisis. We are in turbulent seas without a landmark precisely because we adhere more and more to a scientific view of nature and of human life that both gives us enormous power and at the same time denies every possibility of non-arbitrary standards for guiding its use. Though well equipped, we know not who we are nor where we are going. We triumph over nature's unpredictabilities only to subject ourselves tragically to the still greater unpredictability of our capricious wills and our fickle opinions. Engineering the engineer as well as his engine, we race our train we know not where. Lacking any rich view of human flourishing, our pursuit of a more perfect human is at best chimerical. That we do not recognize our predicament is itself a tribute to the depth of our infatuation with scientific progress and our naive faith in the sufficiency of our humanitarian impulses. Let me, in conclusion, look again at the glass man seen now in the light of this discussion. It turns out that the glass man is in fact not transparent, but opaque. It pretends to show us the innermost man, but it in truth renders his humanity permanently absent. Yes, we see the liver, the kidneys, and the colon, but we learn nothing about the soul. The mysterious character of the human person has not been explained. Rather, it has been ignored, nay banished. The problem is not that anatomizing did not reveal the soul. No one thought that it could. It is rather that anatomizing ignores and then denies the soul, denies the wholeness and the inner depth of the human being, even in the very act that seems for the first time to make it visible to him. In one respect, however, the glass man reveals a permanent truth about the human being, ironically driving home a lesson that I do not believe that its makers meant to teach. When we look at the glass band's head and face, hoping to find the evidence of the human soul within, what stares back at us is only the bony skull. 
universally the mark and symbol of death. Lurking beneath the outer surface of this godlike man is the truth about his vaunted perfection. Alas, poor Yorick, death will be his fate, medicine or no medicine. And surely speaking better than his creators intended, the glass man's skull that betokens death for the individual human being betokens also the deadly consequence for a society that would pursue bodily perfection in ways that do not also join hands in solidarity with those who will never reach it. The idealistic German scientists could not have known that the glass man was the harbinger of anything like the final solution. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Off. I won't do that again. <laughs> Let me start again. The, idea, the idealistic German scientists could not have known that the glass man was the harbinger of anything like the final solution. But they should have known that the biologizing, biologizing and soulless account of human life that they were trumpeting is in fact always deadly to humanity, even if not one crematorium is built. A dehumanizing account of human life can all by itself produce a holocaust of the human spirit. <coughs> to keep human life human, we need first and foremost a more natural biology and anthropology, a robust account of the nature and meaning of our own humanity that will do justice to life as lived, with its high aspirations, deep longings, and rich possibilities for flourishing. We need to draw on the wisdom of poets and philosophers, as well as on the insights of the great religious traditions. But one thing is clear. Our penchant to think only in terms of the American ideals of freedom and equality will not be adequate to the task. In addition, we will need a robust account of human dignity, of our pe peculiarly human special standing, one that has been variously captured in notions that describe us as the rational animal, or made in the image of God, or higher than the beasts, lower than the angels. Faced with the twin dangers of death and dehumanization, it will be important to advance an account of human dignity that does justice both to the equal dignity we all share by virtue of our common humanity and the dignity to which we can all aspire by exercising our humanity to the greatest and finest extent possible. <clears throat> the next two lectures, both on human dignity, will offer a defense of first the dignity of equal humanity and second, the dignity of human excellence, neither of them imageable in the man of glass. There is no question that modern science is one of the truly great monuments to the human intellect. Precisely because it is value neutral and heuristically materialist, it gains the kind of knowledge of how our bodies work that is tremendously helpful in ameliorating disease and relieving suffering but it cannot even come within hailing distance of human perfection, let alone salvation. In seeking our salvation, if salvation is to be sought, we must continue to look beyond ourselves and honor the longings of our souls, while humbly using our limited powers and still more limited wisdom to try to make our world a little bit better rather than a little bit worse. In the end, the good that we will do with science and medicine can only be completed by avoiding those evils that come from seeing health as salvation, the soul as biochemicals, and medicine as the Messiah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Cass. We're uh, open for questions. Uh, I thank Ashley Pavlik, one of the junior fellows in the James Madison program, for being willing to pass the microphone to uh, whoever wishes to ask a question. We have a custom in the Madison program of beginning with questions 
from students, and uh, so let's do that again today. Uh, any students uh, have questions? Raise your hand. Going once, going twice. I think they're all students. Okay. Good, then let's open it up Please. to everybody. Well, after, after looking at the uh, picture of, uh, of the Ubermensch, the Christelmensch, um, I'm, I'm thinking in this uh, election season of political transparency and, and wonder if, um, aside from the philosophical and the uh, biochemical considerations, that to take a political consideration, if we couldn't put uh, pro-choice people, pro-death penalty people, and anti-death penalty people on the same page politically by redefining abortion to include retroactive abortions so that we could, instead of spending $20 million to execute somebody with a death penalty, it would be only a few thousand we could decide that they were misbegotten years ago and somebody should have produced an abortion, but they um, they missed the chance, and now they can do it. Um, you, re you really want my comment on this modest proposal? <laughs> uh, Very modest. <laughs> no, I um, – look, uh, when Richard Nixon was president, um, I can't remember the geneticist's name – uh, it came forward with some very crude data suggesting that uh, um, the genotype XYY, the presence of an extra Y chromosome, was correlated with violent behavior. He found a higher number of such people on, uh, on, uh, guilty of homicide and on death row and was arguing that one should screen children in their early ages uh, to prevent these things. Um, it was, it was seriously discussed. Um, the, the science is faulty. There's all kinds of evidence that show it's wrong. But um, behavioral genetics is the thing of the future, and we haven't even begun to appreciate. You don't even know what some of these genes need to do in order to begin to do some of the correlations. And a correlation is enough to make certain kinds of crude predictive estimates, never to be sure about this individual, but good enough to lead certain people to want to take certain actions on their basis. I doubt very much in this society that um, we're going to have sort of state-sponsored programs of this sort, but it's very easy to see how through, well, we just give people their choices and let them, uh, let, let them act on this knowledge. We will, have, we will have genetic information that bears on temperaments and, 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 and other sorts of things that can be screened for in advance of birth. So. The kinds of decisions, all of them really judging questions of the quality of life or the worth of that life, are coming. Um, and uh, and this, this, I don't want it simply to be uh, um, misunderstood as disparaging the possible benefits of some of these, these techniques. And I understand the anguish in families where the children have, have been born and they face a new pregnancy and, and the like. But as a whole, one of the side consequences of these technologies, nobody intends it, but it falls out as sure as can be, is that one comes to cease to look upon a child as a gift to be loved regardless of his or her merits, and increasingly as a product that has to meet specifications and exists by our will. And that cannot be good for society's view of children. Even if they're healthier, it's not good that we come to regard them in this particular way. So, uh, I, I mean, I, it was slightly to the side, but I, uh, you're, uh, we're going to face these kinds of choices even if no one is so, uh, so hard-hearted as to sort of suggest your, your modest proposal seriously. There was a hand. Um, there was a hand down, a young lady down here in front. No, the the the, uh, the young lady to your to, to. Um, I was puzzled by your um, 
by your claim that it's a bad thing that there is um, a, that people are trying to avoid um, giving birth to disabled children. Um, and I just, you know, when you talk about Peter Singer's view that it's okay to euthanize um, disabled children, I agree with you that that's a that he's wrong about that because I think all infanticide is wrong. Um, and I wonder if the complaint that you have with um, screening during pregnancy and selective abortion of disabled fetuses is really just an objection to abortion, to early abortion. Now, um, and I wonder, so I wonder if you think that if early abortion is okay, or to people who think it's okay, if you think that there's any other objection to the screening out the disabled. And then I also wonder about um, steps that can be taken preconception to avoid, to, in order to conceive non-disabled rather than disabled children. And this just seems like a good thing to me, it, partly because it does seem to me to be bad for someone to be disabled. And if we can avoid creating a situation where someone suffers that particular hardship, um, that's very different from saying that once they exist, there's anything yeah. that they shouldn't be loved, or once they exist, you know, they, they should be killed. It's very different from saying any of that. Um, thank you for the question, um, and thank you for the generous way it was put. Um, uh, and it is an extremely welcome question. Let me make a couple of comments. Let me wrestle with it out loud for you. Um, the prenatal genetic diagnosis and abortion comes under the general heading of preventive health, right? I mean, we're trying to prevent um, the existence of people with these awful diseases. But we have to acknowledge that this is the first instance of preventive medicine in which you prevent the disease by preventing the existence of the one who suffers it. In fact, not only preventing the existence, but destroying it at an early stage of its existence or en route to its existence. I don't want to beg the question on abortion to this point. That's novel. And therefore, there is, um, even, if you don't, even, if you don't think, even if you don't think a fetus is fully one of us, you are in effect saying we are making judgments based upon quality of life um, that uh, set the bar for entrance into life. Okay? Now, um, I wrote a paper, I think it's, it's more than 30 years ago, in which I tried to justify the practice of eugenic abortion or abortion for genetic defect, <laughs> independent of one's opinion on abortion as such. Let's bracket it, exactly the question you asked. And I tried to say, tried to say look, can you articulate a standard to, uh, that would justify this practice that would justify this practice, that would not, in fact, justify infanticide. Not having to do with whether it was licit to kill, uh, but how would you justify what you were doing? And it seems to me, uh, and I, I, I wish I could remember the details of the argument, but there were partly arguments uh, based upon uh, family considerations, partly arguments based upon social considerations, and mostly the argument in a way on the basis of health and natural considerations, which are the ones that are the favorite ones of the people who are giving you these technologies. And it seems to me you can't do it. I, I, give, I, I should look it up and I'll give you the reference if you'd like. It, it appears in the first collection of my essays called Toward a More Natural Science, um, uh, What Price the Perfect Baby, or, or Perfect Baby or something like that. And I tried very hard and sincerely to, 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 to see, um, can you, s on the one hand, it looks as if abortion for genetic defect is the most, um, is in a way the most easily justified one, right? Rather than many of the frivolous ones which are taken, might be taken because I just don't want to have a child right now or it's inconvenient. I don't mean to trivialize the choices that the uh, reason for people. But here would be an objective condition which seems to justify saying this life should not be brought to birth. But precisely what you're saying then is this is a life which is disqualified on the basis of its miseries. And can you affirm that principle there and not, in fact, be saying it about the newborn child, the two-year-old, or anyone along the way? So I, I, uh, I really left that 
paper agnostic. I mean, I said I tried very hard to do this. I couldn't convince myself of it, and I don't. I haven't since seen anybody who's been able to do it. What would you say in response? I mean, this would be. A I, I mean, um, you know, I think that infanticide is wrong because you've got something with the moral status of a person that you're going to kill. Um, if you think that early abortion isn't like that, if you think that there isn't. Um, something morally bad happening when you abort, then it really is a choice um, to create no, but, but, a non-disabled child rather than a but, disabled child, even when it's abortion. No, and then but, I, and then no, but, I don't see the problem. Me, I, it seems to me I thought you were saying, let's bracket the question about abortion. Let's, let, let's not argue about whether it's good or bad, right, for the moment. Um, if, if you're saying um, early abortion is okay, then you don't need a reason for it. But once you're going to give a reason for it, and the reason is that this is a defective child, what you're really saying is the justification you're giving is defectives should not be born. And that means, whether you intend it or not, you're making a pronouncement about lots of us in this room who escape detection for this or that infirmity, um, which will be detectable in 10 or 15 years. That's, that's the difficulty. No, as a legal matter, if, if abortion is legal, um, this practice is legal. It's a question of moral justification. And I don't, see how, I don't see how you can use that moral justification without having it wash over other kinds of lives. You cannot somehow say defectives should not be born except when they're born. They, they don't deserve to be amongst us, um, and we'll somehow learn to treat them differently when they arrive doesn't happen. You look, un you look unconvinced. I'm not surprised. Other Maybe we'll talk about talk it after. So Please. I should, I should surrender. Uh, Professor Jensen, I want to refer to your closing exhortation. Uh, do you assume a sort of perennial philosophy, a perennial wisdom that appears in various religions, various ph philosophical insights? Uh, something like natural law. Otherwise, I'm not sure exactly who, uh, what this exhortation to draw on the best wisdom of various religions and, and Socrates and so forth amounts to, unless there is a common wisdom um, in all of them. Uh, thank you also uh, for that, Dr. Jensen. I, uh, uh, it's obvious that there are large disagreements uh, Never mind the East, there are large disagreements in the inherited traditions of the West uh, as uh, um, regarding nature, humanity, the divine, um, and the basis of morality, and, and so on. Um, on the other hand, uh, it seems to me, I, I would try sort of uh, several responses. It seems to me that at least a large number of them are engaged in family quarrels within a certain kind of large agreement. Um, that there is some kind of attempt to articulate what the human good is or what human flourishing is. Um, and an agreement that you wouldn't presume to offer a proposal to actually improve upon our nature if you hadn't the faintest idea of what good meant. Um, that, I think, is, is a kind of given uh, and would be an argument uh, um, between, say, uh, the Bible and modern liberals, for example, on, on what sorts of things to be stressed. They would still be somehow trying to argue the questions about the human good. Uh, I, um, I'm not arguing for uh, a kind of absolutist moral teaching, and uh, I'm not a um, although people suggest that I uh, hold to uh, natural law teachings, I don't. Um, I don't have some kind of uh, orthodox or I don't have an account. Um, I, in my own life, I've, I've uh, learned from pagan Greeks. Uh, I've uh, learned from modern liberal uh, moral and political thinkers. I've learned from the Bible. Um, and it seems to me the dialectic and the, and the conversation continues. Um, but as between the people who are promising us something better than humanity and the people who are trying to struggle to allow what is human to flourish, 
Um, those minor, those disagreements, it seems to me, uh, in the tradition, are um, are bridgeable, and they belong somehow together against this this new prospect. Um, and um, look. Uh, it's remarkable how many of the great works of, say, Western literature can still be read across the generations and across the ages with sympathy. You don't have to uh, love war to see something of the glory that is the life of Achilles. If you've got a good teacher, they can help you see it past your initial revulsion to the thing. Um, it's possible to see that uh, Socrates is an extraordinary human being. It's possible to put um, either the uh, Hebrew Bible or, or the New Testament in front of people and get them to respond to these things. When I teach Genesis in, in, uh, in class, I have, um, I have Buddhists, I have uh, Hindus uh, in, in the class, and it's always interesting to me to see um, is this a text that speaks only to those who have, as it were, signed up beforehand, or can they somehow see that these are in some ways universal? And the experience is always of the latter sort. So um, I'm putting the tradition, the humanistic and religious traditions that we have, and I would add those of the East as well. Uh, on the one side of the discussion, let's continue those quarrels, but um, they are somehow circling around an attempt to give an account of what it would mean for a being such as us to flourish here in a responsible way and to fulfill something of the promise uh, that nature or God or evolution or whatever it is has bestowed upon us, not thanks to our merit. Please. No, look, um, I mean, the, the case that you mentioned made, uh, got a lot of attention, and it does indicate, uh, among other things, that um, what happens if the principle of parental choice uh, to judge what kinds of genetic, they regarded that as a, uh, not as a disability, but as a plus. And therefore, we should treat that example as the beginning of positive eugenics uh, rather than of negative eugenics. Here's an opportunity to screen for a trait the parents think is admirable. But it does go back, it does raise again powerfully the question of what does it mean to live in an age in which parents are going to be deciding on the basis of the qualities of their children, uh, whether they get into life or not, and what does this mean for the whole society's gift <laughs> of children? Um, the question, we've been an extraordinarily generous nation with respect to handicap and disability. Um, it is, it seems to me, want, leaving aside the questions of costs and leaving aside whether medicine doesn't somehow go overboard at the end of life and gets in the way of a good death for lots of people, that's, that's a subject for, for tomorrow. But um, uh, this is a country which, um, and, and it's really thanks not so much to our liberal political traditions as it is to the Judeo-Christian ethic, that believes that, the, that the, the, the moral health of a nation depends a lot on whether it 
extends a helping hand to those who cannot help themselves or who need a boost. Uh, and uh, private charity in this country uh, is, is astonishing. Um, the question is whether, uh, um, this is partly why I began with those two images. Uh, in Germany, the kind of revulsion against that kind of maiming and the expense and the promise of a kind of perfection through science came together. The question for us going forward is whether or not with new kinds of remedies um, to alleviate these infirmities, and I hope that they will be coming, we also become hard-hearted and less compassionate and less willing to help. That, it seems to me, is the great danger of beginning to think about these things in largely economic terms. And I went by very quickly in this talk, but those, those figures about the demographic figures, uh, um, that, num that one study was a sentence, a study by the Rand Corporation, studying the trajectory of life leading up to death. In other words, uh, look at the death certificates and see what the course of life was prior to that. 40% of people already today die after a period of enfeeblement, dwindling, and often dementia lasting up to a decade. That means every married couple with two sets of living parents, say in their 40s, living in their 40s and 50s, can expect half of them are going to be caring for two such people before it's finished. Never mind what's going to happen to us. I mean, I'm not that far away from it. Um, what kind of a, how long is a society going to want to be spending its money and who's going to be giving care? We're going to have lots of people saying, let's get them to write their living wills quickly and get somebody to exercise these rights that we have so arduously fought for them so that um, they will not somehow hang around and burden us. That will be the real test here. It's not so much, I think, in the, at the beginning of life, but the end of life will really put to the test what we actually, whether we really think um, that there are lives not worth living and are prepared to act on it against our compassionate impulses. Uh, up here, young lady. Please. In one of Peter Singer's classes. And many of our oh, sorry. center around what it means to be human and if it does actually mean anything to be human. Um, one of one of the ideas I'm working with right now, and I would like your opinion, is if you were asked to prove that a human life, any human life, whether they're disabled or too young to be self aware, is worth more than any animal life, could you do it without using religion? And how would you do that? Um, what's the meaning of the question without using religion? Are there arguments for the value of human life other than that God created us and we are value, valuable um, because of that? I'm going to be mischievous. Why is that a stricture on the question? Well, Peter Singer's an atheist, so if, if I'm trying to prove him wrong in a paper I'm working on, um, <laughs> Using, using religious arguments is not the best way to convince them. Um, do you think that the teachings of religion on this subject are accessible only to the religious? I don't know. I mean, many people will disregard them because they're religious. So I'm and, sorry? And I don't think they have to be, but I think in that situation they are. Um, this is shameless of me. Tomorrow, um, I'm going to make the... I'm going to make the argument exactly on this point using certain biblical passages but showing that the truth of those passages don't rest on biblical authority mm -hmm. and, um, and, it, and that I think if you really understood what the text is suggesting there, you could affirm it even if you were an atheist. Though the text is in fact um, from the Noahide Code in Genesis 9. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for the, for the image of God was he made. Now, that looks terribly like the kind of argument that was to be ruled out. 
But if you understood what it meant to be godlike, abstracting from whether man is godlike because God made him godlike, but if you sort of thought what, the, what it means to say man is the godlike animal, and I'll be even shocking, whether or not there is a god, one could still make an argument that man is the godlike animal if you understand certain things about his being. Then you would. Um, to respect that in him, you would not shed his blood. That's an advertisement for tomorrow. I think there are arguments. Um, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of cruelty to animals, but one of the arguments that you could make is no animal is a member of a species that takes up this question. Thank you. Professor Gregory? Um, this follows up on that question, actually. And I hope we have Professor Singer here might be able to give a question to I saw his hand raised. Um, I, I'm thoroughly sympathetic with your criticism of scientism and scientific philosophy. Uh, I'm less sure that at least in professional philosophy of science the names you listed are taken seriously as adequate representatives of that view. Um, but I'm, I'm more interested in this question at the end that Professor Jensen raised too. It seems to me in the response to this question now, uh, the image of God merely works as a metaphor or a kind of wisdom and therefore is not really contrasted with rational animal or higher than the beasts, lower than the angels. It seems like religious arguments aren't going to do a work of justification. They're merely to provide wisdom um, of what v relevant virtues are. And that, that seems at odds, at least with the way the literature I read in bioethics often is the conflicts are in those three sources you provide as the alternative that defend dignity rather than that family quarrel over against the new scientific uh, philosophies. If I could just ask one, one sort of practical example, uh, the question of embryo adoption. Uh, people who <clears throat> admit the image of God in the embryo disagree with one another about what one should do with embryo adoption because it seems to separate social motherhood from gestational motherhood from um, uh, reproductive motherhood. How, how, given these technologies raise questions for people who share those kind of sources you were uh, kind of lauding at the end, what role does this narrative about the turbulent sea without landmarks play? Because it seems like a lot of these technological issues are issues for people who are committed to this view of wisdom um, that you're um, advancing. No, very, um, a, a very rich and welcome comment and a good question at the end. Um, uh, a, I grant that um, the people that I've uh, isolated here for picking on um, are not um, philosophically the most thoughtful. But scientism, in fact, is making its way because there are more people in the larger culture who pay attention to Steven Pinker and Richard Dawkins than they do to any professor in the history and philosophy of science. Um, and they, it's partly because they speak with the authority of science uh, and they practice philosophy and theology without a license and nobody cares. But um, uh, it, it's, it's unimaginable. Uh, the, um, the New York Times book review of two, three weeks ago, the front page cover is uh, the God delusion. Twenty-five years ago, that would have been impossible. Would have been impossible. And uh, that tells you something about the kind of authority and the, and, and the metaphors uh, that are not the, of the selfish gene. Undergraduates will, will sort of repeat it without, or, or memes of culture that are, you know, the, the, so, not Princeton undergraduates. But not Princeton undergraduates. Um, I, I, I recommend some survey research. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I want to come uh, very soon to the end, which was where the, the, the bite was. I, um, to be sure, at the end of this talk, uh, there is, uh, it's really just an advertisement. Um, and there's not an argument. Developed. I do think, uh, and a couple of my previous efforts, one of them sort of vaguely Aristotelian in spirit and one of them more biblical in spirit, have been attempts to try to develop uh, just such a more natural anthropology or natural biology and natural anthropology such that 
what could hold up to view, um, uh, unless it seems to me by tight rational argument, uh, though I hope the reasoning is not irrational, uh, a certain kinds of demonstrations as showings in which people can then lean against or push on them. Uh, I, that's, that wasn't really for today. Um, but uh, I don't think, by the way, uh, and this is a deep criticism of my colleagues in bioethics, I think they think you can do bioethics without anthropology, and I don't think you can. I mean, I really think you need, uh, and by anthropology, I don't mean looking what the Samoans, uh, and all, I'm a, a philosophical account of the human. Um, whether it, uh, an account of the human, whether informed philosophically or by religious traditions, they're open there for us to, to, to reason about them, to think about them, and, and to learn from them. Um, but your, your last point is, uh, I think I should simply have to concede. Uh, to say that, um, to say that uh, we belong even to a homogeneous tradition, uh, that we are going to have from that tradition sort of ethical guidance on all of the things that um, uh, um, society puts before us uh, is obviously wrong. Um, uh, I mean, one could say about, uh, we, we could talk about the embryo adoption case, uh, and I, I have. I don't have a firm opinion on it. I could see that going in, in different directions. But this is nothing new. I mean, uh, um, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln in the second inaugural st speaks about how both sides prayed to the same God. And the issue uh, of the, uh, about which he was speaking is more momentous, I think, than, uh, than embryo adoption. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think it should, I don't think it's a kind of, reason not to try to uh, wrestle with these difficulties in the light of what the traditions have taught. The world tosses up new things that are unprecedented, and we are somehow forced to reason our way uh, to, uh, to the most prudent or to the most decent uh, outcome, uh, allowing for the fact that there are dilemmas where d decent and honorable people of goodwill are going to disagree. So, um, if I miss the... No, it's just, I, I mean, this is a serious question in my own mind. When are we acquiescing to the technological imperative, and when must we wrestle with the facts as they are, the technologies that are available? Well, I mean, look, uh, um, one could say, as was said before, there was um, uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or something like that, We've had a child uh, with this uh, terrible disease. Um, we will either refrain or we will adopt or we will do something else. Um, the embryo adoption situation comes from the fact that in order to make the odds very, very good, um, we've produced a huge number of excess embryos. There are 400,000 human embryos in freezers. Um, the, the cure for that problem is a technique just over the horizon. I mean, I don't like necessarily technical solutions to problems technology creates, but here's a good one. <laughs> if you could freeze eggs, you'll never have to freeze an embryo afterwards. You freeze the eggs and only fertilize them one at a time, and then you won't have to figure out, what have we got in these freezers? And you don't, you don't have to believe that a five-day-old blastocyst is the equivalent of a baby to find it weird that you live in a world that 400,000 nascent human lives of some worth, not of negligible worth, are in suspended animation in freezers. That's, that's weird. Well, we've run over. Uh, we'll, we'll, shot. Oh, we'll get take uh, one more question from Professor Bill Allen. Thank you. William Allen, the fellow of the Madison Program. And it's really the same question. It goes back to the original question that the um, lady here asked. Because as it turns out, I actually do remember that argument from toward a more natural science. I taught it a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> and the burden of the class in which I taught it was to answer the question, what is science? It's a different question that is being answered here today, but I think is relevant. And so I want to pose it to you, because the way we explained your argument 
runs in this manner. That, in fact, our difficulty is not the moral question we think it is. It is the difficulty of the immaturity of science. Because there was, as was presented in your argument there, the possibility of a science that advanced to the stage beyond the moral dilemmas as we presently experience them, where it was no longer necessary to kill in order to make choices. And I think that's the question that was being raised, really. And I, we got the sense that you weren't agnostic, but that you were acknowledging yeah. that in a fully mature science, we would not be posed with these practical dilemmas because we would achieve beyond that limit the ability to exercise those choices without creating the moral problem. And so the question really was, is it the case that there is still some mature science, i.e., is this notion, the scientific notion even, of progress still alive and that our only problem now is that the science is really crude and immature? Oh, thank you very much, uh, Bill, for that. Um, I don't think in, well, you know, I've lost enough gray cells to, uh, uh, to have surrendered deniability. So um, I don't, th but I don't think you have it exactly, the spirit of it right. I'm calling for a more natural science, but it was a science of a different type. That is to say, it would not be a reductionist, merely materialist science. Um, but uh, that wasn't a science that was going to make all of this technology go away. It might offer us certain kinds of guidance for thinking about it, but you're not going to put uh, the Human Genome Project back in the bottle and all of these things that we're now doing are not going to disappear. That's So um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I really think that the more natural science would be very good for thinking about an account of human flourishing such that we do not unwittingly buy our degradation. This is the theme of the third lecture. Um, that you have a kind of rich and full account of our humanity and don't settle for something less. The killing question is a very old question. And um, if you allow me, I would turn the question back on uh, the, the, the earlier questioner. Um, and, and this is where a mature science, not so much a philosophically mature science, but a more gifted, technically mature science, could perhaps obviate the killing decision. If you had a child in utero with cystic fibrosis, right, and they develop a treatment for cystic fibrosis, which is administered in utero, and you have a choice to uh, abort that child and start over, or treat that, or abort that, let me not beg the question, abort that prospective child, that fetus, um, and start over or treat that fetus in utero. Um, do you see a moral difference between those two things, or is it uh, you flip a coin? Many people think, as you do, that early fetuses have, neg have sm s lower levels of moral status, but some moral status. You, 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 you missed, you missed, my, you missed yet, my point. This was a pregnancy that you wanted. This is a pregnancy you want. Um, you're trying to have a child, I think and the child turns out to be have cystic no fibrosis. And the I, I think is, there are reasonable moral views on which there's no difference between aborting and starting over and treating the, the fetus that you have. I agree there's less reason to abort and start over if you could treat the fetus that you have. But that's because I think there are reasonable moral views on which the early embryo doesn't have moral status. And so there's uh, nothing I, wrong, there's nothing I, I was I was asking the question aborted. independent of the moral status. I, I, I don't happen to think, not, I mean, not, not that one should confess this, this, I don't happen to think uh, a, a, a three or three month old fetus is the equivalent of a child. I'm not confident in that belief, and I'm more inclined uh, not to do violence based upon uh, what might be an error, and therefore I'm disinclined to treat nascent life less well than it might deserve if I had wisdom on the subject. That makes me conservative on this point, but not because I'm convinced that, but I don't have to, I think, answer, I don't think I have to confess what I think the moral status of a three-month-old or a two-month-old fetus is to face the moral question, here I am pregnant, 
there's a medical treatment and there's elimination and start over. Um, I think, and this is by the way, not to point a finger of blame and, rule, and ride somebody out of town if they make a choice different from mine, but it does seem to me a moral choice. And you've got something in there which has some kind of claim. You're, you're making a different kind of moral decision if you say, uh, medical disability is a ground for elimination, even in the face of a treatment for it. Well. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, we've, we've got a Thank you.